Venezuela's political and economic crisis. How bad is it? And can it be resolved? Hello, I'm Arnand Naidu, and this is The Heat. For months now, Venezuela has been in crisis with its economy in dire straits and a fight over who should lead the country. Millions are suffering without basic necessities like food and running water. Medical supplies are in short supply. Millions more have fled Venezuela trying to escape a humanitarian disaster. President Nicolas Maduro continues to hold on to power despite the impact of hard-hitting U.S. sanctions. He visited Moscow recently for a meeting with Russian President Vladimir Putin. Well, there is much to discuss, and joining us now from Caracas is Tima Porras. He is a former chief of staff for Nicolas Maduro before Nicolas Maduro became president. With us, too, from Boston is Miguel Angel Santos. He is an adjunct lecturer at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. Joining us from Rhode Island is Vladimir Goldstein. He is chair of the Department of Slavic Studies at Brown University. And with me right here in the studio is Lester Munson. He is principal at BGR Group, a government and international relations consultancy firm. Welcome to all of you to the show. Uh, Tima Poros, let me start with you in Caracas. Uh, Venezuela is facing pretty crushing sanctions uh, imposed by the United States. What kind of impact are these sanctions having on the economy and on the lives of ordinary Venezuelans? Well, the, the impact of sanctions is very broad. That goes from uh, the oil industry. You know, Venezuela is an oil uh, and has been historically an oil producing country. Uh, which historically also has exported more, most of, his oil, of its oil sorry, to the United States. Um, the fact that since January 2019, PDVSA, the uh, national oil company, has been sanctioned by the Trump administration, for instance, prevents any U.S. entity, any U.S. company from engaging in business with PDVSA. That means that PDVSA cannot uh, either uh, sell oil to any U.S. company, but it can also not purchase spare parts, uh, gasoline, uh, solvents, uh, a, a, you know, any sort of um, supplies that you know make for uh, PDVSA's day-to-day -day operations. And as Venezuela is heavily reliant on oil, um, oil exports historically again make for 95 percent of uh, Venezuela's foreign currency uh, revenue, hard currency revenue, uh, the impact is very, very direct. But it, you were telling me about the day-to-day -day life. You, it, it can go you know, from oil industry to, um, you know, the, a few days ago, Venezuelan users of Adobe Photoshop, for instance, uh, accounts were canceled uh, by the company in, in, a, in a clear case of overcompliance uh, from a U.S. company that is simply scared of doing any business with Venezuelan citizens. This has nothing to do uh, with the Venezuelan government, for instance, but still, a U.S. company uh, basically shut down all Venezuelan uh, users of its, of its, uh, of its software. Uh, and again, I mean, you can, you, can, you can name any single aspect of Venezuelan economic uh, life. Uh, these sanctions are making uh, the, the country's economic life even more difficult. I mean, right. one can recognize that Venezuela's economy was already in, in dire straits, but uh, this is making it even harder. And, Tima, what about the availability of things like food and water and other basic necessities? Yeah, again, I mean, um, Ven Ven Venezuela uh, depends as any other economy from foreign supplies. Uh, running water, for instance, of course, water does not come from, from uh, abroad, but all the you know, water systems uh, and the, the uh, um, supplies necessary to maintain uh, Venezuela's running water system uh, are, are also affected by, by not only the lack of revenue created again by, by the sanctions, but yes. also by the inability uh, of any entity from the state to purchase these uh, and these supplies from U.S. companies. And again, the effect of overcompliance makes Venezuela is, is a Western country. So it is related historically to the United States, to the European Union, to the Western um, hemisphere and, and, and Western companies. So once you are 
uh, under sanctions by the Treasury of the United States, m most of the companies become uh, frightened, afraid of doing any sort of business uh, with Venezuelan entities, persons, etc., because right. they cannot uh, be sure that the, uh, their counterparts are not under the uh, effect of sanctions. All right, let's go to Miguel uh, Angel Santos. Miguel, uh, the goal of these sanctions, of course, is to force President Maduro to step down. But there are some who see this as economic warfare. There are critics of these sanctions who say that it is designed to collectively punish the Venezuelan people. Uh, should the opposition be supporting sanctions? Well, let me tell you before that the, the only war that has been waged uh, with the Venezuelan people was waged by the regime of Maduro and Hugo Chavez themselves. I will tell you, before sanctions kicked in in 2016, imports of medicines reported by Venezuela's international partners of trade had fallen 81 percent. Imports of food between 2012 and 2016, when we didn't have any sanctions, had fallen 84 percent. Imports per capita had fallen 85 percent. So the bulk of the war and the suffering of the Venezuelan people has been waged by a regime that is willing to punish its people just to remain in power forever. So that's the background against we have to think about sanctions. So assuming that relieving the sanctions will help the Venezuelan people assumes that the extra money that the Maduro regime captures is going to go to imports of food and medicine. That we know didn't happen before when there weren't any sanctions and Maduro was freely exporting oil, imports of food and medicines fell down by 80, 81 percent, and total imports 85 percent. Mm -hmm. Oil rigs have come down when Hugo Chavez came in power. Yeah. Oil production was 3.5 million barrels per day. I repeat, 3.5. Before the sanctions kick in, oil yeah. production was 1.8. So that's 50% down. So when we think about war being waged against the Venezuelan people, we need to be clear what's the background and who's waging the war. All right. All right. Let me ask Tima for a very quick response to what you've just said. Tima, very quickly, uh, Miguel uh, raises a very good point there, that even before sanctions were imposed on the Venezuelan oil industry, uh, even before uh, there, were, there was any kind of sanction on the country, there were still shortages of food medicine. Go that, ahead, that's a question to me? Yes. Go ahead. Yes. Well, I mean, uh, the, question, the question is the effect of the sanctions. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you want to make a historic account or uh, what, what our evaluation is of the Maduro government's uh, economic policy, we yeah. can spend half an hour on it. We can also criticize Mr. Uh, President Chavez's uh, ruling, but the, the fact is that if, if you want to agree with what Miguel, uh, Miguel Angel says, the fact is that the sanctions do not help. So the, the, uh, I mean, if the, point, the point is, what do the sanctions do to Venezuelan people? They make the situation worse. Right. And the political justification for the sanctions is that they will generate regime change. That's the optics yeah, yeah. of the U.S. administration. And the fact is that they do not generate it. So okay. if they do not generate regime change and they, and they cripple the Venezuelan economy, economy further, yeah. uh, again, it's a very different case to defend. And that's, I, I think, the reason why he's speaking about the past and not about the sanctions. In the All right. Uh, Lester, President Maduro has been very critical of President Trump. Uh, let's listen to part of what he had to say recently. Trump despises Latin America, the Caribbean, the whole world, because he is a supremacist. He believes himself superior to others, and above all, to Latin America and the Caribbean. So, Timmy just raised an important point there about the United States' interest or interference, if you could call it that, in Venezuela. This is about regime change. Right. Um, and the United States has a bit of a history in South America of doing this. What's the end game here for the U.S.? Well, I don't 
I don't actually believe the Trump administration is re interested in regime change. What they're interested in is seeing the legitimate ruler, who is Juan Guaido, assume power in Venezuela. He's the head of the Popular Assembly there. He is rightfully the head of state in, in Venezuela. He's the one who should be controlling the levers of governmental power, not Nicolas Maduro. So I think what the, what the Trump administration is doing uh, is actually supporting the Venezuelan people and their decisions politically about who should lead them. Uh, Vladimir Goldstein, do you see it that way as well, that what the Trump administration is doing is basically supporting the legal, what he believes to be the legal process in Venezuela, and uh, that Juan Guaido should be the leader? Of course not. This is a typical rhetoric which we keep on hearing from Washington, uh, you know, for the last 20, 30 years, you know, that every time they, they are helping or legitimately elected government. We saw it happening in Ukraine in 2014. It's happening all over Middle East. And that that's becomes really tiresome. So what, what we have to be aware that, you know, uh, countries develop in their own way. Some are more successful, some are less successful. We can talk, as you, your guests say, about, you know, rather n not successful mo uh, model of Venezuela. But let them themselves figure it out. United States should stop throwing its weight around, uh, should, should stop, you know, introducing blockade every time they feel like doing it or any country they feel like doing it. And uh, the, the main reason for that is the world is changing. The world is changing. Now we have different players. We have uh, Russia, we have China, we have India, we have Turkey. And they are willing to step in and trade with Venezuela, and they are willing to insist on a um, multi-polar uh, world, which basically have a certain respect for other countries. You know, ever since a Westphalian uh, um, peace in Europe in 17th century, there was a kind of uh, uh, admission that let countries develop their own way. If they want to be Catholics, let them be Catholics. If they want to be Protestant, let them be Protestant. The same thing here. If, you know, Venezuela wants to develop along the Chavez model, let them do that. Let, let, let America and other countries help them to do that. Let, let's do the best we can, rather than introducing some kind of uh, person who is not uh, recognized by majority of Venezuelans, is not recognized by majority of the countries, except, you know, certain countries which follow United States leads. Uh, we know that a lot of poor people yeah. in Venezuela su support Maduro, army supports Maduro. And uh, it's, it, this is kind of r rather kind of futile attempt, as we keep on seeing it. You buy that, Lester? Not even a little bit. Uh, the countries that support Guaido are democracies. Uh, they're countries in the region. They're countries in Europe and around the world. Right. More than 50 countries have recognized the legitimacy of his government. Uh, Maduro is holding on to power using any means he possibly can, including oppressing his own people, supporting rebel groups in his neighboring countries. Just look at the number of uh, Venezuelans who have fled as refugees. It's 10% of the population. It's a real tragedy that's going on in that yeah, country. Yeah, but you know, talking about the recognition uh, issue, there are more countries, in fact, about 140 countries, that recognize the government and support the government of President Maduro. But the number of, co of governments that are recognizing uh, Juan Guaido's government is increasing all the time, and the number that are recognizing Maduro is going down. Right. There's a definite trend. Okay, uh, Tim Apora, something else, and that is a report produced by Human Rights Watch. This report was produced last year, but it pointed to human rights abuses in Venezuela, widespread corruption, and an assault on, on government institutions. Is the government addressing that in any way? Well, currently, the situation in the country is, is extremely bad. Um, uh, and, and corruption, I mean, the, the, uh, the case of corruption here in, the, in, in Venezuela is, is again, a, a very, very serious one. Um, I, I cannot say that the uh, Maduro administration has made any efforts, you know, to, uh, to uh, tackle that problem. But what I have always said to my international, different international institutions and international interlocutors is that the more Venezuela is isolated, the more it is disconnected from the, I would say, the um, normal financial circuits, 
uh, for instance, the normal ways of uh, using uh, channels of payment and, and, and trade with the rest of the world, the more uh, business in Venezuela becomes shady. Um, when, when the government tries to um, uh, basically overcome the sanctions, it starts using um, you know, companies and, and, and counterparts in, in countries of the world where um, regulations are more loose, uh, you start having, you know, gold trades uh, being produced uh, between the government of Venezuela and Middle Eastern companies. Uh, the, the development of, of cash uh, operations has increased mm -hmm. because the Venezuelans cannot use the banking system. And again, the, the sanctions, if we come back to that point, yeah. do not contribute, you know, to the, uh, to the improvement of transparency in the country. So the more Venezuela will be isolated, the more difficult it will be for its people or the international community to hold Venezuelans accountable for, for corruption. Right. Miguel, as someone who supports change in Venezuela, uh, doesn't Tim have a good point there that if you want change, uh, it's not a really good idea to isolate the country? Well, it, it depends. I mean, sanctions are a strategy and are a new strategy. By the way, the focus always falls into the United States, but sanctions have also been enacted by European Union countries. Now, let, let's be just f honest. Uh, there have been two chances this year that have been attempts at possible transitions. Was, one was a military attempt to restore the constitutional order in Venezuela on April the 30th. And a second one is a frustrated dialogue initiated by Norway that then move on to Barbados and then move on to no nowhere. Do you know what was the sole request of the government of Nicolás Maduro at the negotiating table in Norway that the Venezuelan opposition lobbies other countries to leave the sanctions? So they were sitting there unwilling to concede anything that will potentially or remotely threaten their eternal permanence in power just because they have the sanctions. Yeah. And the militants that jumped over the fence in April trying to restore the constitutional order in Venezuela just jump over the fence because yeah. it was made an offer that sanctions will be lifted on them and on their families. So, I mean, they haven't been successful so far. The Venezuelan opposition has tried everything else, yeah. including many dialogue process and elections, and the only attempts at potentially producing a solution, All we right. know, were driven by sanctions. Yeah, Miguel, I'm wondering if sanctions continue in Venezuela, and these are sanctions which really affect ordinary Venezuelans, uh, not rich, well-to-do Venezuelans. I mean. Could they have the effect, really, of backfiring on uh, Juan Guaido? Could they have the effect of helping Maduro solidify his grip on power? I mean, Maduro has his grip on power thanks to the militaries. And that grip will not increase or deteriorate uh, because of sanctions. It's a whole different logic that is sustaining him in power. Now, if sanctions do not lead to a political change, it will deteriorate the conditions in Venezuela. Mm. But I'm just saying that when you assess that deterioration, you need to think what's the counterfactual. What would have happened in the absence of sanctions? Yeah. And we know what happened in the absence of, of sanctions already. We know where was Venezuela headed in terms of poverty, starvation, humanitarian yeah. crisis. So sanctions will deteriorate the conditions. But the counterfactual to that is not a perfect world where Maduro delivers all the social services yeah. that Chavismo hasn't managed to deliver for a decade. All right, uh, Vladimir Goldstein, uh, President Maduro has just been in Moscow. He's been holding talks with President Putin. Uh, one of the things they discussed was renegotiating the terms of the loan, the two large loans that Russia has made to Venezuela. Uh, they met, and this is what President Putin had to say after their meeting. Let's uh, listen. You know that Russia supports all legitimate bodies of power in Venezuela, including the president and the parliament. No doubt we support the dialogue that you, Mr. President, and your government are having with the opposition forces. So, Vladimir, when President Putin talks about the dialogue that President Maduro is having, what is he referring to? And can Russia really play any role? It has a lot of influence with uh, President Maduro. Can it play any role in resolving this crisis? 
Well, you know, Russians, uh, Russian position, they keep on reiterating it, be it uh, Vladimir Putin or Medvedev, their prime minister, is that there should be a dialogue. It should be within the country without any external forces interfering. And they should somehow kind of work, work together, and maybe international community should help them. But they should figure things out themselves. And Russia w will try sort of, you know, to, do, to, to help in their particular way. They are not helping as a, you know, old Soviet Union, you know, uh, helping some ideological, you know, allies. No, Russia will sort of, you know, either lend the money or sell the weapons or use their uh, oil companies to sort of help well, largely for both economic reasons and political reasons. Because what Russia is very insistent, along with many other developing you know, countries we just arrived, is that it's time to stop United States and its uh, allies, or I don't know how else call them followers in Europe, to dictate the world what to do. We remember, as I said, you know, we remember what, how they dictate and, and, uh, to Yugoslavia and decided to bomb one part of it or another one totally reshaping the, the map. They, they keep on interfering in Europe, in Syria, and endless wars. And, you know, of course, the, all these countries are trouble. But why United States should get, you know, uh, first of, and they don't show any way of knowing how to solve it. Did we solve anything in Libya? Did we solve anything in, uh, you know, Syria or Iraq? No. So uh, Venezuelan people are absolutely justifiably suspicious of Guaido, who studied in, in Washington, who, uh, you know, is seen on the pictures with uh, Colombia nar narco dealers uh, trying to get their help in, in invasion. So they are justifiably suspicious. All right. In, they'll be inside dialogue. And that's what uh, Russians are insisting, just trying to send the message that it should be done internally, not externally. Okay. Uh, Lester, what is the U.S. position on dialogue? on some kind of diplomatic negotiated solution to this? Well, I've, I'm sure the United States would support a legitimate uh, dialogue between uh, Maduro and Guaido that led to the legitimate government of Guaido assuming the powers in Venezuela in a way that's good for the Venezuelan yeah, people. Yeah, but what if it takes away that precondition and say, look, we'll deal with the situation that we have right now? Well, I don't, th I don't think that's a, le a legitimate thing to do. The, yeah. the people of Venezuela's view should be respected. Guaido is the fairly elected head of the assembly. He did not start in Washington. He's mm -hmm. a Venezuelan. He's gone on hunger strikes for his beliefs in human rights and democracy. He's suffered uh, in riots and um, been shot at. This is a genuine leader of the Venezuelan people. And I think the international community more and more is supporting him, particularly democracies. The, the countries that are listed supporting Maduro are not democracies. They don't want to see anyone interfere in their internal affairs either, because democracy in their country, like in Russia, would be very bad for Putin. He's the kind of guy who uh, likes to assassinate or imprison his political, the people who disagree with him politically. So he's going to go defend a guy like Maduro, who uh, is resisting democracy. Uh, Tim Aporis, what is your view on a negotiated settlement? I mean, earlier on, uh, Miguel talked about the Norway talks. Whatever happened to those talks? Well, I, I am a strong supporter of the negotiated settlement because I think it's the only solution. Um, uh, those who believe that this conflict will, will lead to one of the two sides prevailing, uh, whether you're a supporter of the Maduro government or of the uh, coalition be behind Guaido, are wrong. There are no conditions in Venezuela for you know, either of the parties to prevail. And therefore, the only peaceful way out of this mess is a negotiated settlement. I know very well the negotiators of both delegations. The, the, by the way, the negotiations moved forward until the month of August, uh, and both delegations were recognizing they were making progress. There was a, a written document with uh, more than 50 points where the two delegations were agreeing uh, and moving forward. But then, yet again, on August the 5th, the US administration imposed a blocking order as secondary sanctions, if you will, which punish uh, even uh, third countries, citizens and entities from third countries, uh, which would engage in business with Venezuela. And that derailed the whole process. Again, uh, stakeholders from the international community, as Norway has been you know, mediating between the two parts, are making efforts as of today for the two parties to resume negotiations yeah. because they, they have an agenda, they have a common ground, but we need that most uh, international stakeholders be 
um, restrained, creative, and, and pushing for a solution instead right. of radicalizing differences here and making the conflict, the conflict even worse. Okay. Miguel, what uh, do you think can break this logjam, and what are the key issues that need to be addressed right now in Venezuela? Well, the key issues that need to be addressed is how you enact some fair and free elections supervised by international bodies, organized by an electoral council that is neutral and internationally recognized. And in that way, you manage to engine the exit of Maduro and his regime out. That is all that needs to be addressed. When, when the person that is talking with this rhetoric of the 50s and the communists it was speaking, I was just thinking, we want to be self-determined, as he thinks. We want to elect yeah. our own people. That's why we elected Guaido with two-third majority. The problem right. is when Maduro realized he wasn't going to hold on to power doing elections, basically he stopped doing fair elections, and he picked out his own opposition. Okay, Vladimir Goldstein, uh, the opposition leader, Juan Guaido, he has called on Russia and China, actually, to back him. Uh, he's offering the possibility of what he said was rapid economic recovery and investment. Uh, will Russia consider that, or will Russia go, as, as Lester just described to us, Russia back a person, uh, as Lester pointed out to us, uh, someone that Putin thinks, uh, that res Putin respects? Well, it's come for me to know what exactly uh, Putin will do, but, you know, what is clear is that they do want you know, they, they said it again and again. They want, uh, like, you know, uh, either a, a new uh, regular elections where people would vote for the leader of the country, not for the leader of parliament, it, it, which means doesn't mean much. Uh, I also want to stress that uh, I just read a, an article recently, interview with a former foreign minister of Spain, not some kind of, uh, you know, undemocratic country, Ana Palacio, who said basically, you know, if we look at, at the foreign affairs, Russia became a power broker while the United States keeps on playing the role of a spoiler. That's the new reality. This is a new reality which, uh, you know, people don't want to address, that the United States continues to push their li line of spoil things here or there. And, and the Russians basically say, OK, you want a guy, you want to have election, negotiate, we'll do our best, but everybody else should help rather than spoil. So I think it's as simple and as clear. Russia doesn't want right. Venezuelan people to suffer, they, uh, you know, but they don't want the United States to uh, bring another regime change, which basically uh, okay. fails the people and brings some corporations in whom nobody uh, likes in any case. That's all we have time for. Thanks to all of you for being with us. We are going to have to leave it there. Thanks for watching. Hello everybody, I'm Arnand Naidu. If you enjoy the thoughtful, engaged discussions you see on The Heat, you may also want to subscribe to our podcast. It's appropriately titled The Heat. Twice a week we take a deep dive on world headlines, talking to experts, journalists and others. It's a fresh, focused and intimate look at the issues that matter most. Whether it's the Hong Kong riots, the latest Middle East conflict or US politics, The Heat podcast gives the clear context needed to understand both what's going on and why. And what's best, we come to you. Whether you're at home or on the go, you can find The Heat Podcast just about anywhere podcasts are found. Just search The Heat CGTN. Have a listen today and subscribe. Thanks.